Dr. Tharoor, welcome to Network Capital. Today we're going to dive deep into your career. Uh, we're a community that's augmenting career intelligence around the world. Today we're going to talk about your career principles, mental models, things that made you effective. I'm not going to make the mistake of introducing you. So tell us who you are and what do you do? <laughs> well, I'm Shashi Tharoor. I'm a, a member of parliament, a third term member of parliament representing Thiruvananthapuram, the capital of Kerala in the Indian parliament. I used to be a minister in the Congress government, but have been in the opposition now for one and a half terms, or one term and a bit anyway, uh, as the BJP is now ruling the country. Uh, before that, I had a 29-year career at the United Nations, ending as Under Secretary General and also as the official Indian candidate to uh, succeed Kofi Annan. We had uh, seven candidates in the fray, and I came a close second. So. In the end, as Groucho Marx would say, close but no cigar, and I left the UN. But during those 29 years, I served the international system uh, in the fields of refugee protection and relief, uh, in uh, uh, peacekeeping, handling and leading the operations in the former Yugoslavia from headquarters, um, headed the, uh, the um, uh, well, worked in the office of the Secretary General when Kofi Annan first took over and then headed the Department of Public Information, which was the UN's largest department with over 800 staff in 77 offices around the world. So it really was um, an extraordinarily interesting career. I feel blessed to have had it. Um, but I felt having attempted for the top job and lost it that I should move on. And I came and reinvented my life here. Um, in addition to both careers, I've also had a parallel life as a writer. I began writing uh, as a small child at the age of six. I was first published at the age of 10. I have seen uh, my work in print ever since, which means it's now been 54 years that I've been in print in one place or the other. I've published 20 books, which um, uh, have all been written in English, but all have been translated in one or more languages, Indian as well as foreign languages. Um, I suppose the one unifying theme is that India features in all of them to a greater or lesser degree. Um, uh, what else can I tell you? I've, I've won a few awards. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased that I've tried to uh, to make an impact as much through my ideas as through my work. How did you decide to study history? Well, you know, it was a passion of mine from a very young age. It's, it's interesting, as, as a kid, when I was at school, I just had a talent for taking examinations. I kept inconveniently coming first at everything I studied. And uh, uh, that uh, was all very well. But when we had to stream for class nine between science and humanities, uh, I chose humanities and my teachers and principal were very upset. And they showed up, at, they summoned my parents to school. And they said, this is absurd. This is our best science student. He's come first in science throughout. What is he doing switching to humanities? And my parents, like all middle class Indian parents, of course, wanted nothing more than to have their son become a doctor or an engineer. And so they looked at me with shock and horror and said, why aren't you taking science? And I said, because I can't stand the subject. And they said, but you've come first in it all your life. To which I said, yes, but I forget everything I wrote in the examination the day after I've taken them. Whereas if you ask me about history or literature, I will tell you things that I never learned in school or in the school textbooks, because those are two things I read beyond the syllabus, because I'm so passionate about them. And that's why I want to study humanities. And I must say, for that day and age, my father was a very unenlightened, was a very enlightened figure. And he said, all right, you know, you're the one who has to, you know, wake up every morning and go to school. You study what you want to study. Um, I continued um, acing uh, the exams and I came first in West Bengal State, in fact, with the highest possible mark. So it would have been first in India as well in the ISC examinations. And once again, the pressure was upon me. The only useful and profitable thing for a, um, a humanities student to do, if they do well enough, was to get into economics. Um, I said, no, I want to study history. And my father said, what on earth is history useful for? With economics, you can do an MBA, you can get a well-paying job, your career is made. What's the matter with you? And I said, listen, Dad, I mean, you know, it's a question of what moves you. Economics doesn't move me. It's never really <clears throat> tweaked my brain cells. And uh, and though I did score well in maths, I'm not terribly fond of maths. And maths economics, I'm told, is getting more and more 
into you know econometrics and quantification and so on. History is about the world, about stories, about what shaped the world we live in. That's what interests me. So once again, with um, with um, great enlightenment, I was allowed to go off. In fact, St. Stephen's College was so shocked to get a history honors application from somebody with my marks that I became the only student admitted without an interview. I believe <laughs> it's never happened since, but I, I got in and, um, and did history. And I think the short answer is really this. I think history is a way of understanding the world through what has happened in the past, which gives you, I think, a broader perspective on what's going on in the present and may orient you if you have the right mindset to think creatively about the future. In college, I'm given to understand you did theater, you did debating, you even aced the IIM exam and all of these things. Tell me as a college student figuring out next steps, you what were you thinking and what did you end up pursuing? After? No, I just was there to have a good time. And frankly, St. Stephen's was a wonderful place in the sense that the extracurricular activities were something else. This is the college that had two campus magazines, both funnier than each funnier than the next. It had um, multiple student societies in my time, over 50 student societies. And you could also start one of your own if you got the blessings of a faculty member. So didn't I you start the Woodhouse? The Woodhouse. Yeah. Well, I didn't start it. It started in the late 60s, but lasted only a year or two. When I came in, it was defunct. So I was able to work with a couple of close friends to revive it. And um, I was president of it uh, in my second year, but my first year I was secretary or something. But we revived it. It became a hugely popular society for about 20 years, uh, including running a practical joke week in college, which, which was really quite an event. Uh, unfortunately, uh, um, half a generation after my time, or maybe almost a generation, about 20 years after my time, um, one of the practical joke weeks went awry. Uh, apparently it involved, uh, because by then college had become co-educational and the joke involved uh, stringing up uh, ladies' undergarments on top of the cross in front of the chapel, <laughs> which clearly didn't amuse the college authorities and the society was shut down. Um, I didn't quite know how that happened because in my time we had a strict rule that every practical joke had to have the prior approval of the faculty advisor. Every student society had a faculty advisor. So we wanted to make sure precisely that something too hairy didn't happen. But clearly something, either the faculty advisor was uh, not focused on what he was approving that time or um, the later a lot of students had done away with that rule. But anyway, so I did all of that. I thoroughly enjoyed debating since Stevens had a great debating tradition. And um, in those days, um, uh, third class trains to campuses around the country and debating was, was a favored pastime. Um, so I was uh, all over India uh, debating for the college. Um, I enjoyed theater, so I acted uh, both for the Dramatic Society and the Shakespeare Society at St. Stephen's, but also in the plays of the girls' college, Miranda House, because both of us were single-sex colleges, so we needed to borrow the opposite gender from one of the other colleges. So I did some of that. And, Shakespeare uh, mostly, right? Uh, not necessarily. Um, I did Brecht at Miranda oh. House, uh, St. Joan of the Stockyards, where I was the villainous J. Pierpont Mola, the big fat <laughs> capitalist who tortures St. Joan, as it were. Um, and um, we did, um, uh, we rehearsed for a Chekhov, but then the whole cast rebelled and we were so bored with it, we didn't want to go on. I did another play which um, involved the Bangladesh liberation in some form uh, for an MH um, entry into the IIT Kharagpur, uh, IIT Kanpur play competition. I was there to debate for St. Stephen's, but I acted in the Miranda House play. Anyway, <laughs> so we had a lot of, lot of fun. I mean, I, I think college is a place where you really grow up and find yourself and you need to be prepared to go and try all sorts of stuff. And I sort of fancied myself um, as a bit of an amateur cricketer. But I could see with the quality of the cricketers around college, it wasn't even worth trying. So I never bothered to show up even for the nets. I just focused on the things I knew I was pretty good at. And that included speechifying, quizzing. I founded the quiz club, which is still in existence almost five decades later. Uh, my invention, there was no quiz club in any college campus in the oh, country until I invented one. And now there isn't a college campus without a quiz club. <laughs> so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of some of these legacies. Um, edited the Stephanian, um, uh, was on the editorial board of Cooler Talk and probably would have been the editor had I not won the elections to the college presidency, the union presidency. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, I, I must say that um, uh, it was a, an eventful three years during which I'm proud to say I made a mark on campus, made a lot of friends, a few enemies as well. These things happen in life. Um, but I got a taste for um, uh, meritocracy, for creativity, 
<coughs> and for um, relating to people in a very pan-Indian way. That was a great thing about St. Stephen's. There was simply no class, caste, region, language, religious bias. When I became president, it was striking that, for example, every alternate election in the preceding 10 years had been won by a person from a minority community. Mm. And uh, that, that struck me as typical of the attitude at St. Stephen's. Um, we had people, uh, you know, there were affirmative action programs, people from underprivileged castes, and they were admitted, but no one ever noticed or talked about their caste. There was a certain um, elitism, but it was an elitism of meritocracy. It was an elitism which wasn't about, oh, let's get the latest fashions from the West or let's go off to study in the West. It was actually all about, let's see who can do better getting into the IS or the IFS. The IFS being the much desired service, service at that time, yeah. the foreign service. Uh, so that was the kind of uh, culture. Um, and it was highly literate. People read. Um, it was highly knowledgeable. I mean, I still remember we had a, a Delhi University strike during my first year. And we didn't know how long we'd last. So people like me were from far away. I was from Calcutta at the time. My parents were there. Didn't go home because we didn't know how long it would last. And there's a three-day train, two, two-day train journey home. The strike might be over before you got home. So we just <laughs> stayed. And in fact, it went on for three or four weeks. And during that time, every day when we go off to the coffee house with some seniors, and I had one particular colleague who regaled us with some of the historical lore. He was already in his fifth year, he was an MA student, but he would tell us stories going back when he was a fresher and so on. So we collected a lot of lore, a lot of sense of what the history of the college was like, the traditions of the college were like. And it, it was a richly, richly enjoyable period which I look back upon with a tremendous, tremendous degree of affection. Uh, my loyalty and affection for St. Stephen's is entirely because of that, uh, those three magical years there. Uh, yes, I had bad ragging. I mean, I was unfortunately um, uh, a favored target for the raggers. I had already published articles and stories. Mine was a known name when I came. All the veteran raggers wanted to rag me, <laughs> that kind of thing. And not all of it was pleasant. Some was. Um, but I, I became um, somebody who was hyperactive on campus. I did multiple things. I knew people intersecting across various sections of society. And I think the testimony to that was that I won my election hands down. So um, that was a great time. But then I did apply to go abroad. And in fact, I was prompted to do so by a college senior, uh, a brilliant history student a year ahead of me. And you also took the cat. I also took what in those days was just the, there were only two. MBA programs, the whole of India in 1975. And there was IIM Calcutta and IIM Ahmedabad. There were no other IIMs, no other management institutes. Maybe XLRI had been established, but it was a long way down the total pole. And each institution had its own entrance exam. So the two IIMs had a common entrance exam, uh, but separate interviews. I see. And um, I did <coughs> top that examination, yes. Uh, which I took only because of my father's sake. Uh, he said, look, if you don't get a scholarship to go to the States, you know, I can't afford to send you there. So do this as a backup. And I remember I came first in the um, Calcutta list and second in the Ahmedabad or the other way around. So I was right there and I could have gone to either one. Um, but that means you must have been good at math as well. Yeah, I was good at, I was pretty much, I was one of these irritating kids who was good at everything uh, at that level anyway. Um, I, 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 yeah, I mean, I, I did well, I did very well, uh, similarly in the quantitative in the GRE, um, uh, when I, when I sat for the graduate, you know, America, the exams, exams to go to American graduate school. Um, and that's because frankly, um, I think taking exams tends to be a bit of an art and often it, it's not necessarily revelatory uh, of either your genuine interests or the quality of your mind. It, it, it reflects a few things. Uh, certainly an ability to retain uh, information, facts, figures. Um, and you also read very quickly. Precedents. I read fast. I write fast. Yeah. I mean, all the other exams were written exams. You wrote essay on, essay type answers. And I always had the most answer sheets, not because my handwriting was big, but because I wrote very fast. So um, the fact is that um, uh, there was all of that. Some quick thinking is required. That I, I, is important. And you, you must have the ability to think on your feet, which... Uh, you know, nature blessed me with, or God, or my parents' genes, or whatever it was, I had that. Uh, and I did have the ability to retain facts and figures, remember precedents, remember associations. You know, if I've solved a particular math equation in school, and a similar one comes up in the exam, I knew what I was supposed to do, that sort of stuff. So uh, it wasn't that I particularly enjoyed or relished it. Whereas I can come across even an academic work of history today, 
and be lost in it uh, in the midst of all my work and everything else. And that's the big difference. Um, so, so ultimately, um, so eventually, your you you got through uh, GRE, got through the full. I did, and I, I I applied for international relations. I was very interested in world affairs. And that's why my dream was the foreign service. And college, you spent a lot of time studying that as well. No, nope, we didn't have any courses in that. We just studied history. Um, but but uh, you know, I read the newspapers, and my dad worked for a newspaper. So certainly, when I was home in Calcutta, we had uh, you know three or four newspapers in the morning, and another four or five from around the country in the evening. And I grew up essentially reading. Um, uh, eight or nine newspapers every single day. Of course, that's a smaller task than it sounds because in those days, newsprint and foreign exchange shortages meant that each newspaper was between eight and twelve pages long, not like today's monstrosities. <laughs> but with those um, with those short newspapers, you know, whatever foreign news there was, I devoured. So I was pretty well informed about world affairs, and I would go to the um, uh, in Calcutta. We had the USIS the Information Service Library, the American Library, yeah. where there was a tremendous amount of international publications available. The British Council also had them, but for some reason, um, uh, I, I spend more time in the American Library than at the British Council. I used to go to the British Council to debate, I remember, but not so much to, to borrow uh, books or materials. Um, but anyway, um, looking back on all of that, I think it helped that one was so terribly deprived in those days of other distractions. There was no television in the India of my childhood. There was no, uh, obviously, no computers, no personal computers had been invented. Uh, handheld games or Nintendo or PlayStation were not even a gleam in some inventor's eye. No, and um, mobile phones, uh, you know, uh, are, are for your generation, of course. So but the truth is that um, you really needed books, words, writing, reading, etc., if you were looking at anything to do with um, uh, either education, entertainment, or escape. And for me, that's what books represented was all of those. So you got full scholarship there, but I just want to have a, a, a reflection on your college. Uh, you spoke about rapid experimentation. In three years, you tried out a lot of things, discovered what you wanted to pursue, and actually got a full scholarship to pursue it. Um, you also developed a certain amount of interests which you excelled at. Uh, was there anything that was particularly uh, troublesome about the times that you lived in there? Yeah, well, the emergency. Yeah. I mean, the fact is that um, I went to college 72 to 75, and um, by 74, the country was in turmoil and ferment. We were seeing a lot of rebellions. There was a railway strike. There were a lot of workers on strike. In Gujarat, there was the Nav Nirman movement that brought down the Congress government there. Uh, Mrs. Gandhi was getting more and more beleaguered. The Jayaprakash Narayan movement called the Total Revolution Movement had started. Um, I was elected president in what, June perhaps of 74. And <clears throat> these things were heading for a peak over the the, 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 the the following nine months. I mean, I was president until from June to April or May, whatever it was, that the academic year finished. Um, and um, I must say that it was, it, was, it was a turbulent time. St. Stephen's on principle was a non-political union. So we didn't belong to NSUI, ABVP, SFI, any of those. None of them were allowed to be active on campus. Uh, I believe they're still not, but in those days that was very much the case. And therefore, we did not choose to belong to DUSU, the Delhi University Students' Union. I see. So all the political stuff happening in the country and in the national capital infected DUSU, but we were the um, insulated group from that. Mm. Um, some of my union cabinet members came to me saying, we'd like to participate. And I said, you participate in individual capacity. Because, you know, at that point I had this <clears throat> perhaps like the old fashioned idea that a student's job is to study and that our union was about improving the rights, facilities, conveniences and so on of our students on campus to, to do with campus issues, the mess food, the uh, college facilities, the rules governing the union, all of that stuff we could agitate on. Um, and we did. And I was fairly effective, I think, with, uh, in arguing with the principal. But um, I must say that um, I didn't think at that point that we should officially have a St. Stephen's Union representative on the stage at a Jayaprakash Narayan rally. And looking back, uh, even a couple of years later, I regretted that to some degree because in many, many ways what happened was it was a defining a defining period. The emergency was declared shortly after I graduated. I graduated in whatever it was, April or May, and it was in June that the emergency was declared. And the suspension of all our political freedoms, uh, the censorship of the newspapers, the arrest of some politicians, including MPs, 
all of that, I think, was quite shaking, but it became particularly defining for me when I went to the States later that year. So I traveled out in, um, you know, the, the dates are fuzzy in my head, but sometime probably in July, first to the UK July, for August, a holiday, yeah. and then in, in August on to the States, um, where, where school, uh, graduate school started in very early September or late August. And my recollection of that period was, Essentially, because Indians were not that common uh, in those days. Now they're all over the place. But it was rare enough that uh, you would actually stop and say hello if you ran across an Indian in the street in Boston. There weren't that many back in 1975. Um, uh, or, or meet one on the subway, whereas today, I don't think you can get our subway or walk on a street without seeing an Indian pretty much any Western city. Mm. But that's been a dramatic change since then. So when you were there, and I was the only Indian at Fletcher, at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University, which was actually jointly run with Harvard, so we'd go to both campuses. Uh, I was the only uh, Indian student at, uh, at Fletcher, and I was constantly being called upon to defend what was going on in the country, uh, which was obviously being adversely reported upon in the Western press. And my um, initial instinct, having just come from India, was to serve as a kind of unpaid envoy for the country by saying... No, become no, no, defensive in a way. Become about. defensive and say, listen, it's maybe only the rights of people like me that being taken up. One of my articles, in fact, was censored in the first week of the events. Is it? Yeah, it was not an article. It was a short story called The Political Murder. Since I said nothing to do with politics, the murder is going to be allowed. So it was immediately censored. It's published in my subsequent collection, The Five Dollar Smile. So you can read it and see whether you would have censored it had you been an emergency <laughs> era censor. But I had this kind of defensive thing that you know, people like me, we can afford to write in newspapers and magazines. But Mrs. Gandhi is doing this for the poor, the, the faceless Am Admi who is who's otherwise you know suffering and, and being neglected. And therefore, um, we have to understand and explain. But what used to happen was I had a roommate at Fletcher. Most of the Fletcher students, in fact, over 90% were mid-career. They'd all had a couple of years work so experience. You were a good decade, decade and a half younger. I, I, was, I was not a decade now, but at least a minimum of five, six years younger. And of course, sometimes 25 years younger than some of the more serious mid We had a U.S. Navy admiral in my class, whom oh, I wow. stayed in touch with. <laughs> Um, the one of my classmates who was not that old later became a, a U.S. Navy admiral. So we had quite a few interesting things. But um, in my classmate was a guy who'd been a, my roommate was a guy who'd been a journalist for a couple of years before coming to Fletcher. A German guy? No, no, no. I had a German classmate, but this was a, an American, Charles Faulkner Bennett. And Charlie uh, had to finance his life by continuing to work. So he would attend classes and go off and do the night shift at a radio station in Boston. And he would come back bringing for me the telex printouts of all the news agency feeds that didn't make it to the newspaper. I mean, the Boston Globe or the New York Times might carry a story. He would come back with, you know, a dozen stories, maybe 20 stories, reams of stuff. And I would stay up late into the night reading them in much more detail than anybody else living in America or sadly because of censorship in India was seeing. Hmm. Uh, and because he was, as a journalist, was getting them fresh off the of the press, uh, fresh off the printer. And there was no appetite in the American media for too many stories about India. So no one missed those stories. He'd tear them off the teleprinter and bring them to me. And I began to get profoundly disillusioned with everything I was reading. And um, I remember one of the things that crystallized it was actually not something happening in India, something happened in America. Uh, an Indian student in Chicago, uh, Ashok Kumar, Arvind Kumar, I can't remember, fairly uh, not today a terribly well-known name, um, had spoken up against the emergency and then had gone routinely to get his passport renewed. And the Indian embassy in Washington refused to renew his passport and said, you go back to India. We don't want anti-nationals like you, you know, speaking here uh, in America kind of thing. And I just was so shaken because for me, my passport was a symbol of everything that the freedom of India, the you know, Nehruji's and Gandhiji's struggles for independence had achieved. It enshrined the values of the constitution. And to see that passport being reduced to a political um, guillotine, as it were, mm. was too much for me to bear. And from then onwards, I became quite critical. The Turkman Gate incident, the massacres, the vasectomy camps, all of this stuff came. So I was quite down on um, on the emergency by the end of that. I've written about this in my book, India from Midnight to Millennium, yeah. My Own Awakening. But that would be the defining political experience of that generation. Of that and you time. seem to be in a hurry. You finished your PhD at 23. Tell us more about that. Like what, what 22, was actually, because um, um, I, I defended it. Uh, on the last weekend in March 1978, when I just turned 22 earlier that month. And what was your thesis on? It was actually on Indian foreign policy making. I'll tell you, 
interesting story. The reason I was in a hurry was because um, my scholarship would run out. That particular scholarship, which gave me tuition, room and board, um, was actually uh, never going to be extended for more than three years. In fact, it had never been extended for more than two. But because of my exceptional record, I'd won the best student award and had straight A's and stuff. So they gave me a third year. But they said, that's it. They're after you better support yourself. And I thought, if I don't get a job, and it wasn't that easy for an Indian to get a job in America in those days. And the world economy was not in brilliant shape. America was, you know, it was the, the mid-70s were sort of the doldrum years of the U.S. economy as well. Jobs weren't sprouting all over the place. Um, I thought, if I'm just going to spend my time struggling to make ends meet, I'll never write a good thesis. So why don't I, in fact, just work 18 hour days and write the whole damn thing? So I went off. I First of all, I had to move a very unusual thing called the academic petition. What is that? Which um, uh, it, 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 it was a complicated procedure, which no longer is available to Fletcher students, I've been told. Uh, in fact, it's no longer available pretty much any campus where I was able to short circuit um, a lot of procedures. You see, at Fletcher, uh, you could do the MA in one year. You could do a second degree called the MALD, which is like an MPhil yeah. thesis. Then you have to take additional coursework for the PhD. And then you could, um, uh, having got your MALD, which required an oral exam as well as written, written papers, you would then have to study for about a year and then do your minimum one year. And then you would do your PhD orals, which would then qualify you to submit a thesis proposal. And then you would write your thesis. Now, what I did is I short-circuited all of this. I did my MA courses in such a way that I partially fulfilled the MALD requirements. MALD required, if I remember correct, three multidisciplinary fields. A PhD required four. But while doing the MALD, I did four fields so that I was fully qualified in coursework without doing an extra year of coursework. And then instead of defending my MALD thesis, I asked to be examined at the doctoral level so that I would be qualified for, to write the doctorate. Um, already at the end of my second year. Now, I was advised against this. And one of my professors very bluntly told me, no one passes my PhD oral without studying for it for a year, because I'm not talking about examining you at the master's level. I will ask you questions you won't be able to answer. You're going to flunk. Why do you want to do this? And I said, sir, I'd like to take a chance. I mean, I was incredibly foolhardy when you think about it, <laughs> but I suppose intellectually courageous. So I took the orals. My most comfortable subject, the one I thought I was an ace at, is the one I narrowly uh, past that the only subject of the of the four I was examined in uh, orally in which I didn't score a distinction. Um, the other three I won a distinction, including from the professor who said he'd probably flunk me. So I suddenly qualified at the end of two years to write a thesis. I traveled to India, interviewed everybody because Mrs. Gandhi's government had just fallen in the elections of 77, got access to everybody, met Indira Gandhi twice for an hour each. All the foreign ministers were alive. They interviewed all of them, interviewed defense ministers, senior bureaucrats, prime minister's office people. And it helped that everybody was just out of power. And none of them thought they were going to come back to power in a hurry. The Janta had swept the election, the Janta party. And so they were all very candid. And um, I just listed all the confidential interviews in my footnotes, gave a key to the interviews to my advisor, which is all they required, um, so that they would know who was being quoted on what, and they could check against his known beliefs or whatever. And um, I wrote a 660-page TypeScript, typed on two fingers myself, uh, in eight months. So it, when I look back on it, it was marginally borderline insane, but I did it. And, 18 uh, hours a day for a very long time. 18 hours a day. Yeah. Uh, on top of which, I managed to get married at the beginning of that <laughs> academic year, at the age of 21, to my college sweetheart. Uh, and and went with her to her university campus, which was Syracuse. I see. Um, and so I was writing the thesis in Syracuse and driving to Boston uh, once a month to submit, you know, chapters and discuss with my advisor, and then driving back and writing more. And in those days, remember, no laptops, no computers. Uh, your information, all your notes were taken on little scraps of paper or index cards. You shuffled them around to get the sequence that you wanted to write about. And then you wrote directly. It really, when I look back on it, um, <laughs> it took a lot of chutzpah to do what I did. But as a result, I defended my thesis the month of my 22nd birthday. Um, the only reason I didn't get my degree the following month was because the typing of my thesis was deemed unsatisfactory. Fletcher had very high standards. The typing? The typing, because I had typed with two fingers on a non-electric typewriter, and they wanted certain oh. professional standards for that. So as a result, um, and remember, there's no word processing, so your footnotes have to be in the right page corresponding and all of that stuff. 
And you know, when you're typing yourself, you might slightly go wrong. So I had to engage a typist to do it. And, and therefore, it couldn't make it in time for the degree of 78. So I got the degree in 79. But I'd already passed the orals. And other than the physical retyping of the manuscript, nothing else was done. It didn't need to be reread. It didn't need to be uh, re-examined. So in effect, I earned my PhD at 22 and got the certificate at 23. God. Um, you talked about um, history often teaches you the wrong lesson. Um, when you look, when you finished college, when you started your diplomatic life, uh, did you feel that by that time history had taught you any wrong lesson? Um, yes and no. I mean, I think that knowing history gave me an enormous sense of perspective on anything happening in the world. Um, and that was very important to me. Um, I would say that um, the history of countries predisposed me to be interested in them uh, more than others. So, um, for some reason, I had you know Chinese and Japanese history never really grabbed me beyond the point. And I, I actually conducted a petition at St Stephen's College to be allowed to study American history. Hmm. And I was told by the then head of the Department of History, Muhammad Amin, he said, "My dear boy, Americans have no history." <laughs> so I said, "Well, sir, I'd like to study it anyway, and Delhi University permits you to offer us a choice." between American history and history of the Far East, and you've never given us that choice in all these years of St. Stephen, so I'd like to have it. He said, all right, go conduct a petition drive, and if you get 10 signatures, I'll offer you, I'll find you a teacher. So um, I collected 17 signatures from my classmates, and a course was offered in American history. Um, and so, you know, it shows you I was very interested in what are the forces that have created this superpower uh, from its past. And when at Fletcher, I did a, a graduate level course in American diplomatic history, which is also very instructive. So all of this meant that you have perspective. But when I said history can teach you the wrong lessons, I was specifically referring to the fact that in reaction to the exploitation of India by the East India Company, which had come to trade and stayed on to rule, that Indian nationalists drew the conclusion, not that colonialism and imperialism were bad, which they were, but also that capitalism was bad and that, for example, if, a, if a, an American businessman was coming to invest in India in the 1940s or 50s, instead of welcoming his money and thinking it will create jobs in India, our nationalist leader said, oh, no, that's the thin end of an imperial wedge. They say they're coming to invest, but they really want to rule you. And that's the way in which I think history can teach yeah. you the wrong lessons. That is the particular context in which I wrote that sentence. Of course, it's quoted a lot now, um, but I, I meant it particularly in terms of the lessons that we learn from the colonial experience. However, yes, we can find many, many other lessons. And certainly if somebody learned the lesson from the emergency that the Congress is permanently anti-democratic or bad, wrong. The emergency was an aberration. It lasted 22 months. In the overall history of the Congress, going back to Nehruji and continuing with the leadership of people like Rajiv Gandhi, and, and that is Rao. It was a very, very profoundly democratic party. And what is more, um, it, it um, respected the rights of others to disagree. So when I saw in the 90s that the bigger threat to Indian democracy was the bigotry and communalism of the BJP forces, um, I began to shift my interest towards the Congress which in any case in the meantime had abandoned the other thing about it that I critiqued, which was the statist, heavily bureaucratized socialism, it really was state capitalism under another label that was stifling the economy. And they moved away from that from 1991 onwards and liberalized the country dramatically. So for those reasons, I thought that the Congress was the right party. It now stood for liberalization, tempered by social justice, the residue of its long commitment to socialism. And at the same time, it, it had experience of running India's place in the world, of international diplomacy, of robust security policy. You know, Congress was the party that after all won the Bangladesh war, that made India a prominent figure on the United Nations. And at the same time, uh, a, a party which truly believed in inclusive India, both economically and also in terms of um, caste, creed, religion tried to represent everybody. Right. So that was why I became inclined to the Congress. And there, I think if I had learned the wrong lessons and been seduced by people because they had fought for democracy in the 70s, I might have ended up with the very people who are undermining democracy 40 years later. 
Um, <clears throat> when you finished, uh, you could have uh, given your track record of cracking exams. I think IAS, IFS would have been a natural choice, but you decided to join uh, the UN in part because you didn't want to be a part of the system that was... Uh, that was capable of the emergency. Yeah, yeah no, I, I've written about that too. I explicitly declined. As I said, I was very good at taking exams. I literally hadn't failed um, or done badly in any exam I had written at that point. And I had every reason to believe that in the Indian system, I would do well in the IAS examinations. In fact, I called them the UPSC examinations because the IFS was the was the goal and no one got into the IAS. Right. Um, if they could have gotten to the IFS, that was the way to go. So, yeah, I, I, you know, that would have been my career ambition to get into diplomacy. But I felt, how can I serve a government that can take away the passport of the Chicago student, yeah. that can do this kind of stuff, uh, that can lock up opposition leaders and so on? I just can't do it. So I didn't take the exam. Um, and um, I had two other career options available in India. One was to teach and the other was to write. And because my father worked for a newspaper, they're not on the journalistic side, he was on the managerial side, the advertising side, um, I would have had access uh, very easily to that profession. And since Stevens offered me a teaching job when they looked as if there might be a brief uh, question about my visa, uh, because I was getting married and my, and my uh, visa officer decided to revoke my visa on the grounds that my marriage implied a desire to settle permanently in the U.S. Oh. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, he, he was persuaded by his ambassador to change his mind. That's quite another story. And many years later, when I was working at the U.N., I met him and we had a laugh about it. But he, he, he would have revoked my visa. So at that point, I went to Delhi and saw my college principal. And he said, we'd love to have you back as a teacher. You have a job tomorrow. So those are the two careers that I might have had. Uh, alternating, I mean, instead of going into the UN. But I, I went back to Fletcher, did my PhD, which was a way of postponing a career decision because I wasn't actually uh, sitting the exams as soon as I was eligible. You could do it at 21. I just turned 21 in March of 77. I could have sat the exams that summer. But I decided instead to go to Fletcher, do the PhD, and look around for opportunities in precisely these two fields, teaching and journalism, were the two things that attracted me. Um, but I ended up, in fact, um, uh, getting called for an interview at the UN. I had met her. Which is uh, also remarkable. super competitive, right? Super competitive. And the main UN was actually closed because they had uh, uh, an overrepresentation of Indian nationals. It still is the case. Right. I think there was only a brief window a few years ago and a whole bunch of Indians retired and the quota wasn't filled. But I had met, uh, again, through completely serendipitous circumstances, a senior UN official. Uh, an Indian called Virendra Dayal who was holidaying in Calcutta um, in August of 75 and happened to read an article I wrote in the Statesman at the moment of, of, of the Independence Day celebrations. It was called A Sense of Belonging and um, it was an article in which I expressed some of the uh, cynicism and impatience of my generation. And uh, Virendra Dayal read this article and apparently said to his host when we were staying with a relative of his, Terrifically interesting article. Uh, and, and the host said, would you like to meet the author? And we and Al said, sure. And he said, no problem. He's acting in a play with me and we have the cast party at my home tonight. <laughs> so um, in the, at that cast party, I met Vin and Al. We had a wonderful conversation. And unlike many senior Indians, and he's a former IS officer who had gone to the UN on deputation, was working for the UN High Commissioner for Refugees. Uh, he actually took an interest in a young man at that point, 19 years old and said, uh, since you are coming to the U.S., if you come to New York, then have come and look me up. So I, in turn, took him seriously and looked him up, and he was very gracious, hospitable, uh, took me to the U.N. delegates' dining room for my first Bloody Mary in the delegates' bar, <laughs> uh, invited me home for dinner, and so on. And then he said, look, I'm impressed by you. I think you should apply for the U.N. But he was a, such a correct figure that he refused to participate in the process. And so when I was called for an interview in the New York office of UNHCR, which he headed, uh, he stayed out of the interview, and I was interviewed by three others, a German, a New Zealander, and uh, an American, I think, I can't remember. Anyway, they liked me, and they recommended me for a further interview headquarters in Geneva. And so I flew to Geneva, and by that time, they'd spent so much money on me, they had to hire me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> did you speak French by then? No. Uh, well, I, what I did was I tried to teach myself a bit of French, um, and I had a bit of a good year of language, so I, I, I wasn't totally black. But as soon as I got to Geneva, I enrolled in the UN classes. And within a few weeks, I got a couple of double promotions. I finished the three-year course in a year and two months. And I got, I still have the official UN full professional fluency certificate, full professional proficiency certificate. 
My partner is French, right? She heard you speak French somewhere on some YouTube or something, and she was very impressed. <laughs> yeah, I, I just love the language. And one, I, the one piece of advice that everyone gave me that I refused to take was, they said, don't try and speak French unless you know the language well, because the French really will be contemptuous of anybody who mangles their language. And I said, the hell with it. If I don't speak the language, I'll never master it. So literally in my first month in Geneva, I was trying out sentences and expressing what I could have ideas. I used to watch um, television dubbed in French. So you'd watch a John Wayne movie and there was John Wayne on his horse in his <laughs> cowboy apparel drawling in French. But it was a terrific education. I used to love the uh, Tantan Asterix comics, which I'd read as a child in India. So I bought them in French and read them uh, to, 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 you know, because I knew roughly what the story was from my, from my English language reading. Now I would read them in French. So all of this meant that I, I picked up the language fairly quickly. And I, I'm, I'm delighted to say it remains a really beloved language. And I, um, I'm somewhat frustrated that it's very rusty because the only persons I get to speak French with are either the French ambassador, whom I may meet once every two months at most, or three, uh, or a French journalist who may come to interview me. Um, so you, you, know, you suddenly realize that you, you rose words up and sentences quickly. and ideas that you have been very fluently expressing you said had you been living you in a French-speaking atmosphere. Satisfied person made it you have to struggle for because you uh, haven't you know, heard those ideas that. expressed in um, French. Um, yet. What was motivating you then and how different is it uh, from what motivates you now? Well, I mean, what motivated me um, when I started at the UN, working for the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, um, at the very beginning was simply curiosity. It would be great to live in Europe and work in the UN. And I had no real sense of what the work involved. And um, at that point, they were looking for smart generalists. They weren't actually looking for anybody with any knowledge of humanitarian law, humanitarian affairs, charitable work. I was raw. I learned on the job. And as I began to see human suffering at its worst, because refugees are people who not only lost everything, their homes, their food, their clothing, their, uh, their possessions, but they've also lost their country, their friendships, their basic cherished assumptions. It's a, it's a tremendously deprived group of people and working for them and seeing their plight in different countries around the world that I traveled to for the UN, uh, including frequent trips to Africa in my early years, uh, motivated me very differently. It was about how can we do something to ensure that these people's problems aren't still problems tomorrow. How do we try and, and resolve these crises? And that became my motivating factor. I came to Singapore three years into my UN career to head the office there. Um, and uh, we had a very unusual problem of Vietnamese refugees uh, who were fleeing in little boats, fleeing the communist regime there, uh, being rescued on the high seas by merchant vessels who were calling in the, onto the port of Singapore and um, who had these refugees on board and had to disembark them. Uh, and Singapore was getting very frustrated with the large numbers and um, they were even threatening to shut down their port to, to refugee arrivals and so on. At the time that I took over the office, we had almost 4,000 people in a refugee camp that the government had nothing to do with. They said, you run it. It's a UN's headache. You want us to take these people, you solve them. But unless you get them out of here quickly, we won't let any more land. So I had a, an enormous challenge at that point of not only looking after refugees in a camp that as far as the UN was concerned, I was not supposed to be running because we were not quote unquote operational. We were supposed to be uh, a protection agency. Um, and at the same time, I was supposed to be arranging the resettlement of these people on an emergency basis, as well as preserving links with the Singaporeans sufficient as to permit more people to disembark. So it really was um, a, a very interesting diplomatic, political and humanitarian challenge. So negotiating on the one hand with tough officials of the Singapore Home Ministry and Foreign Ministry, my very first meeting with the Singapore Foreign Minister, um, his principal aide handling the UN said to me, our Prime Minister has told us we must grow calluses on our heart or we will bleed to death. That was the first line I heard. You can imagine that um, that, that was the kind of way in which um, uh, uh, the government was taking a tough line on refugee disembarkations. Then there was a question of the port authorities. There was a question of the resettlement countries who um, uh, were willing to take refugees rescued by ships flying their own flag, but were balking at those flying flags of convenience like Panama, Liberia, flags of developing countries that couldn't take them, etc. And these people were just piling up in the camps. Uh, so all of these things uh, required a tremendous amount of creativity, energy, dedication, commitment. And at the end of the day, as I said, I knew I could put my head to the pillow at night, 
knowing that things I'd done, a call I'd made, a meeting I'd held, a decision I'd taken, had actually changed somebody's life. And these are lives of people I could see in front of me. They were not just statistics on a piece of paper, as so many other bureaucratic jobs entail. So that motivation, that motivation of actually making a difference to the lives of real human beings has sustained me ever since. And in the next section of the podcast, we're going to try and connect what you did back then with what you do today and see how you got here. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Utkash. Great talking to you.